Welcome to Broadway Church Online. My name is Cheryl, and you have joined us on the final week of our series, How Not to Read the Bible. Pastor Darren will be sharing a message from God's Word a little later. But before we continue, I would love for you to share this video, as it really does help to spread what God is doing here at Broadway Church. And if you have not yet subscribed to our channel, I encourage you to do this now, and then you'll always be in the loop with all that's going on here at Broadway. If you happen to miss last week's message, Pastor Avery continued our series by sharing how the entire Bible from beginning to end points to Jesus and his plan of salvation. Check out this clip. And what's so cool about the story of the Bible is that this main character, Jesus, he isn't just some far off distant person. In fact, it's the only story we can read where the main character loves us back. Which kind of leads to the big idea I have for you today, which is this. Just as Jesus is in every part of God's story, he is also in every part of your story. Just as Jesus is in every part of God's story, he is also in every part of your story. Just like we can see Jesus all throughout the Bible, you can see him all throughout your own life. Whether you realize it or not, he's been there all along, loving you, looking out for you, leading you back to him. Maybe you've seen it. Maybe when you look back, you can see all the ways that he's been there. Maybe you can see his faithfulness. Maybe you can't, maybe it's hard. That's okay. I want you to know that either way, he sees you. He died for you. He loves you. If you want to hear the full message, you can go to our website where we have the entire sermon available for you. In just a few moments, the worship team is going to come and lead us in worship. But before that happens, why don't you check out some of the things that are coming up here at Broadway. Hey Broadway, thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Avery and I am one of the pastors here at Broadway. Now we have a ton of stuff happening at the church for you and your family, so why don't you check these things out? This Tuesday, we invite you to join us at the Vancouver campus for a hymn sing at 6.30 p.m. in the Hornby Chapel. This is an opportunity to come together regardless of age and sing beloved classic and ageless hymns. The adult Bible class at the Vancouver campus is beginning a new study on the Lord's Prayer. Join us on Sundays at 10.15 a.m. in the lower auditorium. Our Food for Families program is looking for volunteers at their Vancouver location. We have Tuesday afternoon, Thursday morning, or Thursday afternoon shifts available. This is a great opportunity to serve your community and get to meet some of the other amazing volunteers. Email us today to sign up. Next Sunday, we are beginning our You Asked For It series, and we will be tackling the question, my life is fine, why should I follow Jesus? You don't want to miss it. Our annual Back to School Blast campaign is here once again. We are giving away 1,000 backpacks to vulnerable kids and hosting a fun event in East Vancouver, South Vancouver, and the Tri-Cities. For $30, you can sponsor a backpack for one child, and for $100, you can provide school supplies for a student, a fun event, and guarantee adopt-a-school support for that child's school for the next year. Help us reach our goal of $100,000. Simply indicate Back to School on your offering envelope. To learn more about our back to school event and ways to get involved, visit the City Reach website. We want to take a moment to acknowledge one of our staff members, Shelly Clifford, who is celebrating her 40th year working at Broadway Church. This is a huge milestone, and Shelly, we just want to say thank you for all that you've done for this church in those 40 years. We are so grateful for you. If you happen to see Shelly around the church, make sure to congratulate her. If you missed anything that I said, you can always visit our website, broadwaychurch.com, for more information on our ministries and events. And while you're there, make sure to connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Now, it's almost time for us to worship, but first, I want to read to you a short passage to prepare our hearts for what God wants to do in this moment. In Psalm 31, 19, God says, how abundant are the good things that you have stored up for those who fear you, that you bestow in the sight of all on those who take refuge in you. God has an abundance of good things for you. It might not feel like that in this moment, but know that God is faithful. He is just, and he has your best interest in mind. Sometimes life can distract us from this truth, 
But in this moment, as we prepare to worship, let's fix our attention on God and remind ourselves we can take refuge in Him and trust in His goodness. This verse is just as true now as when it was written back then, and it's true for you. Well, good morning, church. We're so glad you're here this morning. Yeah. 
worship for Him. God, we just give you the praise today. You're so worthy of it all. Whatever we walked into this place with, whatever burdens or shame or guilt, whether we feel your presence and we feel close to you or we feel distant, God, I pray wherever we're at, you would come and you'd meet us. Open our hearts to hear what you have to say today. Help us to lay down at your feet the burdens that we walked in with the shame, the guilt that we feel. Just lay it down at your feet because you paid for all of that on the cross. So we give you our hearts today and we pray this in your name. Amen. 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 Thank you. You may be seated. Welcome to Broadway Church and thank you worship team for leading us in worship today. Now, if you're new to Broadway Church, we would love for you to fill out a digital in-touch card. You can just scan the QR code on the screen and fill out the form. A pastor will get back to you and help you find answers to your questions about growing in your faith or connecting here at Broadway. We are now going to transition into our time of giving. If you are new to Broadway Church, please feel under no obligation to give. You do not have to pay to watch or attend church. However, if you would like to financially support what God is doing here at Broadway, we would love for you to do that now. Our preferred way of giving is for you to go to the Give tab on our website and check out the online banking giving option. We can accept your credit card over the phone if you call into the church office. 
You can come in in person from 9 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. during the week if you'd like to drop it off. You can also use text to give. If you text the word give to the number on the screen, it will walk you through the prompts to get that set up. Or you can mail in your checks to the church. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Pastor Darren will be sharing a great message with us in just a moment. But first, why don't you take a moment to subscribe to our channel so you can stay up to date with what's happening here at Broadway. And you still have time to share this video as it really does help to reach many more people and share the good news of Jesus. Thank you once again for joining us today. Imagine yourself sitting across the table from a stranger. You get into a friendly discussion and eventually the topic of faith comes up. Now you inform the person that you're a follower of Jesus. Then they respond with a strange comment. They say, oh, so you believe in unicorns. You believe in magical flying creatures with the body of a horse and the tail of a lion and a single large protruding spiral horn from its forehead. Now, taken aback, you assure them that you don't believe in such things. So the other person responds by saying, but I thought you believed the Bible. Don't you know that the Bible teaches that unicorns are real? The person then points you to Numbers chapter 23, where it says, God brought them out of Egypt. He hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. And then they take you to Psalm 22. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. At this point, you scratch your head and you start to wonder if the Bible can be trusted. So what do we do with this? And why are we even talking about this? Well, today we're concluding a series we've entitled How Not to Read the Bible. It's a series inspired by the book of the same title by author Dan Kimball. Now, over the last few weeks, we've done our best to equip people how to properly interact with the Bible by exposing some examples of how people improperly interact with the Bible. In the very first week, we established the fact that the Bible can mess you up. It's a complex piece of literature that needs to be treated carefully. In week two, we address the unique nature of the Bible when we learn the Bible is a library, it's not a book. In week three, we advised you to never read a Bible verse. That was the week we learned some valuable study techniques. In week four, we learned that the Bible was written for us, but it was not written to us. That was the week that we learned the danger that can come when we treat every Bible verse as if it was directly written to us and for us. Then in week five, the theme was, all the Bible points to Jesus. That week, we saw how the mission of Jesus can be found throughout the scripture. Now, way back in week number one, I made you a promise. I promised that at the end of this series, I would tackle some controversial passages in the Bible. I promised you that I would address some examples where the Bible appears to be saying some crazy things. And I promised to address the craziness by applying some of the principles that we've learned over the last few weeks. Which brings us to today's topic, unicorns, slavery, and genocide in the Bible. Three crazy topics that critics claim can all be found in the Bible. Are you ready? 
So buckle up. We have a lot of ground to cover in about 25 minutes. So let's get right to it. Let's begin by going back to the biblical passages about unicorns. Now, let me declare right off the top that mystical, magical, flying, one-horned creatures are not in the Bible. You say, but I just read about two of them. I just read two verses. Actually, you didn't. Let me explain. Every time someone tries to link the Bible with unicorns, you can be certain that they are quoting from the original King James version of the Bible. Now, back in the early 1600s, the King of England commissioned a group of scholars to produce a reliable English translation of the ancient Hebrew and ancient Greek scriptures. Now, the translators were assigned the task of finding English equivalents to ancient Hebrew and ancient Greek words. Now, for the most part, this was very doable. However, every now and then, the translators back in the 1600s would come across an ancient word that did not have an obvious English equivalent. And this was the case when they came across the ancient Hebrew word ram. Now, ram is the word that was translated as unicorn in Numbers 23 and Psalm 22. Four hundred years ago, scholars were in the dark as to what the word Raham was referring to. Now, they knew it was a word for some strong ancient animal, but they were not sure what exactly that animal was. So they looked to other ancient writings to help them gain some clarity. For example, they studied the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures from the 3rd century BC, commonly known as the Septuagint. In that ancient translation, they noticed that the Hebrew word rehem was translated into the ancient Greek word monokeros. Monokeros literally meant one horn. Now, they also looked into an ancient resource known as the Latin Vulgate. That's an ancient Latin translation of the Bible. So the translators of the Latin Vulgate simply took the Greek word monokeros from the Septuagint, which meant one horn, and they used the Latin word unicornis, which meant one horn. Which is why, by the way, the official Latin name of a rhino is Rhinosaurus unicornis. So, using these two ancient sources, the translators of the original King James Version just followed along, and they turned the Latin unicornis into the English unicorn, meaning one-horned animal. So, when you connect the linguistic dots over the centuries, ram in ancient Hebrew became monokeros in ancient Greek, which we became unicornus in ancient Latin, which became unicorn in Old English. It should be noted, at no time in biblical history did any of those words refer to a magical flying horse. Now, over the centuries, scholars have come to realize that Re'em likely refers to the now extinct aurochs, which was a large, powerful beast that stood over six feet tall and is an ancestor to our modern domestic cattle. So, most versions today translate the Hebrew word as wild ox. So, did the original translators of the King James Version believe in magical flying horses? No. And any attempt to claim otherwise is to ignore and distort history. Okay, so much for the Bible and unicorns. What about the Bible and slavery? Now, critics will often point out that there are verses in the Bible that speak about slavery without condemning it, and in some cases even seems to be endorsing it. For example, in the Old Testament, there were rules laid out for when you wanted to buy a Hebrew slave, or for the father who wanted to sell his daughter. In the New Testament, slaves are instructed to obey their earthly masters with respect and fear to try to please their masters and not to talk back to them. What's going on here? Well, in the very limited time I have today, let me do my best to answer this. Remember what we learned earlier in this series? We learned that the Bible was written in ancient cultures by ancient writers to ancient cultures about ancient issues. We learn that to properly interpret ancient documents, you need to read the words as they were understood and used in their original context, not as they were understood and used today. The common mistake made by many when it comes to the Bible and slavery is assuming the word slavery, as it's used in the Bible, is describing the same thing as when it's used today. 
The common mistake is assuming the word slavery as it's used in the Bible is describing the same thing as when it's used today. That's a false assumption. Oh, the words are the same, but what they're describing is not the same. Slavery in the Bible was not identical to slavery in the American South in the 1700s. In the Bible, the terms buy and sell, owner and master, were certainly used. But these terms did not necessarily imply that the slave or servant was mere property. Even today, we use similar terms, but we don't see them as dehumanizing. I mean, every day we read about some professional athlete being bought by an owner or traded from one owner to another owner. Do we feel sorry for those professional athletes? I highly doubt it. They make a lot of money. Well, why not? It's because we understand how these words are being used in our culture and in our context. Well, it's similar when it comes to how the words were used in the Bible. When we read about slavery in the Bible, we need to read about it as it was known in the ancient cultures being described. For example, in the Old Testament, kidnapping a person against their will and then forcing them to work for you for the rest of their lives was strictly forbidden. The Old Testament says, he who kidnaps a man, whether he sells him or he's found in his possession, shall surely be put to death. It was the death penalty for doing that. Another Old Testament passage says, if a man is caught kidnapping any of his countrymen of the sons of Israel, and he deals with him violently, or if he sells him, then that thief shall die. So you shall purge the evil from among you. Slavery in the Old Testament was clearly not identical to slavery in the American South. So what was the word normally referring to when used in the Old Testament? If an Israelite had no money or they'd gone into serious debt, they had the option of becoming what was called an indentured servant or a slave as a way of earning a living, as a way of paying off their debt. Now, it wasn't a wonderful option or an ideal practice. However, in ancient cultures with limited economies, it was better than starving, better than being jailed. It was better than being killed. It was allowed as an option, and laws were made to prevent its abuse. For example, Old Testament laws were put into place ensuring that slaves could not be harmed. All debts were to be canceled every seven years, and the longest a person could be a slave was six years. So let me say it again. Slavery was not ideal. It was not God's desire, nor was it God's design. Slavery was a product of broken humanity in a broken society. And sometimes God deals with our brokenness by limiting the damage that we can do to one another. I mean, that's what he did when it came to marriage. God's ideal, God's design for marriage is one man with one woman for their entire lives. But due to the hardness of our hearts, Jesus said, and the brokenness of our lives, we live in a world that is full of unfaithfulness, full of abuse, and full of relational breakdowns. And as a result, as a concession, God allows for divorce as a way of limiting the damage that our brokenness can do to one another. Well, slavery, like divorce, was not God's desire, nor was it God's design. It was a practical concession to the reality of broken, sinful humanity. So simply stated, slavery in the Bible is not what is often being depicted by the modern critic. God is not pro-slavery. In fact, the entire biblical record is the story of God going to extreme lengths to deliver humanity from all bondage, from every form of slavery. Slavery to sin, slavery to fear, slavery to addiction, even financial slavery. Now, I am sure that you have all kinds of follow-up questions for me on this topic. Hold on to them for now. We'll get to that later. For the sake of time, we need to move on to the final issue we promised to address today. Perhaps the most notorious and controversial issue in the entire Bible is represented by a passage in Deuteronomy chapter 7. It's God's instructions to the leaders of the nation of Israel as they were preparing to return to the land they once called home, modern Israel. Now, God's instructions went like this. 
when the Lord your God brings you into the land you are entering to possess and drives out before you, remember that term, drives out before you many nations, Hittites, Girgashites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, seven nations larger and stronger than you. And when the Lord your God has delivered them over to you and you have defeated them, then you must destroy them totally. Make no treaty with them. Show them no mercy. What is going on here? Many people claim that this is a call for genocide. Genocide being defined as the systematic attempt to exterminate a national, racial, religious, or ethnic group. Now, many claim that God is commanding the Israelites to hunt down and to exterminate every Canaanite man, woman, and child. That's what many people claim, but is that what is actually being described? Now, this series is entitled, How Not to Read the Bible. And one of the key learnings in this series is to never cherry pick a passage, but to always read a passage in its proper context. Otherwise, the Bible can mess you up. Otherwise, you can make the Bible say whatever you want it to say. So then, what is the context of this passage in Deuteronomy? The year was 1400 BC. The world looked very different then from how it looks today. Vast nation-states with defined borders like Canada and the United States did not exist at that time. Nations were basically walled cities that were home to large, extended families. Canaanites was a broad term that roughly covered seven nations or seven cities. And these so-called Canaanites were living in the land that God had given to a man named Abraham and to his descendants, now known today as the Israelites. However, The Israelites had spent the last 400 years in Egyptian bondage, hundreds of miles to the south. While the Israelites were stuck in Egypt, the Canaanites took over Israel's land in the north. But now Israel was free from their Egyptian bondage. They are heading north, heading back home to reclaim their territory. And as they were on their way, God gave them very explicit instructions regarding what to do when they confronted the Canaanites. God said, you must destroy them totally, make no treaty with them, show them no mercy. That does not sound very loving, and that does sound an awful lot like genocide. Is God commanding genocide? Well, if these two verses were all that we had, we would have to wonder. But these two verses are not all that we have, so we do not have to wonder. The fact is, we know much more about God and his dealings than this lone passage. The truth is, there was never a time when God was only interested in the Jews. His expressed purpose has always been to rescue people from every tribe and every nation, including the Canaanites. Well then, what's he doing wiping every Canaanite off the face of the earth then? Actually, God is not doing that. God is describing something very radical in this passage, but God is not describing something as radical as genocide. Let me do my best to explain things. Have you ever heard of something called necrotizing fasciitis? It's commonly known as the flesh-eating disease. This is a rare infection of the deep layers of the skin where bacteria releases toxins, and those toxins trigger the immune system to overreact. As a result, the body actually destroys itself. If not caught at an early stage, the only option is to amputate above the area of infection. It means losing your leg to save your life. If your child had a flesh-eating disease and that disease was aggressively marching its way up your child's limb, destroying your child's flesh as it traveled, what would you, a loving parent, do? When faced with an aggressive infection, how does love respond? Sometimes love means taking drastic measures. Now, many people refer to the destruction of the Canaanites as God killing innocent men, women, and children. However, over the last 80 years, archaeologists have discovered that the Canaanites were anything but innocent. We know this because all sorts of ancient tablets have been unearthed, describing in detail the beliefs and practices of these people in their own words. 
We now know that the Canaanites worshipped a whole bunch of gods, but their supreme god was someone they called El. El was a dark and shadowy figure. El was described in Canaanite writings as a vile and highly pornographic god who engaged in all sorts of sordid sexual perversity that I wouldn't dare to describe today. Suffice it to say that the Canaanite god had three wives who also happened to be his three sisters. According to Canaanite literature, El wasn't elected supreme commander of the gods. No, El got there by murdering his father, and he stayed there by murdering his son and cutting off his daughter's head. You could say that El had a bit of an anger problem. Yet the Canaanites worshipped him, and in doing so, they became just like him. Their culture was saturated with horror, murder, and rape. They forced their own wives and daughters into prostitution as a form of worship. Canaanites had sex with children. They had sex with family members. They had sex with friends. They had sex with their neighbors. And they had sex with their neighbor's spouses. In fact, Canaanites had sex with anyone and anything, including animals. And the ultimate form of Canaanite worship was to burn their children alive. It's described in ancient writings. They had these uh, bronze statues of these ancient gods that they had, Moloch, and they would place on the arms of this bronze statue that was on fire. They had this fire underneath the statue. So the bronze was searing hot, and then they would place a child in the arms of this burning bronze statue, and the child would scream as it was being tortured and dying. And the writings tell us that the Canaanite drummers would be drumming loudly to try to drown out the sound of the screaming babies as they're being tortured, as they're being sacrificed to these Canaanite gods. Folks, These were not innocent, white picket fence, just minding their own business kind of folk. These were vile, debauched, corrupt, ruthless people. And they didn't reach that state overnight. The moral rot had been festering for centuries. In fact, one of the reasons why God allowed Israel to remain in Egyptian bondage for hundreds of years was because God was giving the Canaanites time to repent. Listen to what God prophesied to Abraham hundreds of years before Israel was in Egypt. God said this to Abraham, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, that would be Egypt, and they will be enslaved and mistreated 400 years. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, that would be Egypt, and afterward they're going to come out with great possessions. You, Abraham, you're going to go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, back to Israel, for the sin of the Amorites, that would be one of the Canaanite clans, has not yet reached its full measure. For centuries, God had been incredibly patient with the Canaanites. For centuries, the Canaanites didn't receive God's judgment for their corruption and chaos. God waited for well over 400 years. And during that time, God gave the Canaanites time to repent and change their ways. God had been doing all that he could to challenge the hearts of the Canaanites. How do we know that? Before invading the first Canaanite city, Jericho, Israel sent spies to scout out the city. And a Canaanite woman named Rahab recognized them as Israelites, and she secretly approached them. It's recorded in Joshua chapter 2. It says this, Before the spies were down for the night, the woman came up to them on the roof and said, I know that God has given you the land. We're all afraid. Everyone in the country feels hopeless. We heard how God dried up the waters of the Red Sea before you when you left Egypt and what he did to the two Amorite kings east of Jordan, Sion and Og whom you put under a holy curse and destroyed. We heard it and our hearts sank. We all had the wind knocked out of us and all because of you and God, your God, God of the heavens above and God of the earth below. Rahab proved that the Canaanites knew of but were resisting God's power. God had been patient with them. God had warned them. God had given them ample opportunity to change their ways. But instead of getting better, they got worse. So, 
As Israel prepared to enter the land that had been promised to them, they were stepping into a land that was rotting with a cultural, moral, and spiritual flesh-eating disease. But there's even more to this context. Remember how Rahab mentioned how terrified the Canaanites were? We just read that. Well, this is because God promised the Israelites that he himself would go to work on the hearts and minds of the Canaanites long before Israel ever set foot in the land. God promised, and I quote, he said, I will send my terror ahead of you, and I'm going to throw into confusion every nation you encounter. I will make all your enemies turn their backs and run. I will send the hornet ahead of you to drive, underline that in your Bibles or on your outlines, to drive the Hivites, Canaanites, and Hittites out of your way. But I will not drive them out in a single year because the land would become desolate and the wild animals too numerous for you. No, little by little, I will drive them out before you until you have increased enough to take possession of the land. See, this was not a campaign of genocide. The Israelites were not commanded to hunt down their enemies throughout the land. No, the Israelites were commanded to drive out their enemies from the land. And Israel was told that God himself would help them to do this. God promised to go before them and put fear in the minds of the Canaanites, provoking the Canaanites to flee from the land. Any Canaanite that fled would be left alone. Any Canaanite that refused to flee, any Canaanite that insisted on remaining behind to fight, was to be shown no mercy. The stated goal was not for the Canaanites to be annihilated, but for the Canaanites to be driven out. In fact, 13 times the Bible records that God would help to drive the Canaanites out of the land. Israel was only commanded to kill those that refused to leave. That's war. That's not genocide. Now, we know this was not a call to exterminate every Canaanite because Rahab, the Canaanite woman from Jericho, was not killed. In fact, she was welcomed into the nation of Israel. In fact, to this very day, her name can be found in the family tree of Jesus, the Jewish Messiah. So then, when you study the passage in context, you discover this. For centuries, God tried to treat a moral infection with less invasive measures, but every attempt was resisted and rejected. It was finally time for drastic measures. The moral infection had to be amputated, and the nation of Israel would serve as God's scalpel. Not because Israel was morally pure or superior to everyone else. In fact, centuries later, God would punish Israel in the same way he punished the Canaanites. He drove Israel out. But at that moment in human history, Israel had to be protected. You say, why? Why was Israel so important at that time? What made Israel so special at that time was the role that Israel was playing at that time. Israel was God's delivery mechanism for eternal life. You see, Israel was the the mechanism God chose to raise up the Jewish Messiah, the person who would come to save us from our sin, to deliver us from our sin. And this was in the early stages of Israel's history. So God had to protect the nation of Israel, protect the sacrificial system, protect the prophetic system, protect the system of priests and so on, because it was through that system that God would raise up Jesus of Nazareth, who would then become the Messiah, the savior of the world, God was protecting you by protecting Israel. We are here today as followers of Jesus because Israel was protected, because the Messiah came out of the root of Israel, because the Messiah came and he lived and he died and he rose again from the dead to cleanse us and protect us and save us and deliver us from evil. Your eternity was at stake. My eternity was at stake. Israel could not be destroyed by the Canaanites. Israel had to be delivered from the Canaanites. Well, there you have it. I did my best to tackle the topics of unicorns, slavery, and genocide, and I tried to do it in less than 30 minutes. Check your watches. I'm not sure how I did. Now, I realize that I have not answered all of the questions that are linked to these issues. In fact, I've likely incited even more questions. 
With that in mind, let me say this. I have two classes coming up over the next several months that may interest you. You can visit them live or you can watch them online. At our Broadway church, at our Vancouver campus, we have a Bible class between the two morning services. I often teach that class. It's a class where I teach for about 40 minutes and, or 45 minutes, and then we have a Q&A afterwards where you can push back and answer, ask any questions you want about what's being taught. It's a highly interactive setting. Well, starting this September, I will be teaching a six-week class entitled Putting the Bible Under the Microscope. In that class, I'll be teaching all about where do we get our Bible? Uh, you know, how do we know the Bible is so-called infallible? What does that mean? Are we saying there are no mistakes in the Bible? What does the Bible mean? And what do we mean when we say that the, the Bible is the inspired word of God? How did God inspire? Did he dictate it verbally to every author? What do we do when we think we found a mistake in the Bible? All of these things we're going to be discussing at length starting this September in that class. You can join me live or you can watch it online. Then, in the spring of 2025, I'm going to teach probably about a 10-week course I'm calling The Toughest Topics in the Bible. In that class, I'm going to revisit the slavery and the genocide topics, drill down even deeper on both of those, addressing further issues and questions and passages I didn't have time to address today. I'm going to touch on some other challenging topics as well in that series. Topics like, is the God of the Old Testament angrier than the God of the New Testament? Why did God harden some people's hearts in the Old Testament? Why did God love Jacob but hate Esau? Was polygamy God's will in the Old Testament? Does the Bible endorse the suppression of women? And other questions like that. Let's face it, there are some tough topics in the Bible. But one topic that is not difficult to understand is what God has done on our behalf. He has come in the form of Jesus of Nazareth, died to pay our moral debt, rose from the dead to offer to forgive us and cleanse us, to restore our relationship with God. It's a gift that he offers. Have you received this gift? If you've not yet received it, I want to give you as I close an opportunity to do that very thing. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for the Bible. I thank you for your word. There's some ugly portions because there's some ugly things that humanity has done over the millennia. But in the midst of it all, woven throughout the ugliness of human history is the beauty of your message and the beauty of your mission to set us free from the bondage of sin and shame. God, I have my own sin and shame in my life. And I confess it to you. I admit it to you right now. And I choose to accept the gift that you're offering me, the gift of forgiveness and eternal life, purchased through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. There's a lot I don't understand, God, I admit it. But what I do understand, I choose to believe. I accept your gift. Come and live within me now by your Spirit and begin to change and transform me from this moment forward. By the authority of the resurrected Jesus, I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, welcome to the family of God. I advise you to tell somebody. If you know another Christ follower, tell them about the decision that you've made. Or maybe you'd like to text the number that you see on the screen right now. One of our pastoral staff will text you back. We're not going to phone you. We're not going to spam you. We're not going to put you on a mailing list. We'll text you back and just offering our services to you in any way that we can. Well, God bless you. Thank you for being with us today at Broadway Church. I hope you've been benefiting and been blessed by our How Not to Read the Bible series. God bless you. Thanks for being with us at Broadway Church today. Thank you for joining us at Church Online this week. If you have any prayer needs or requests, please text the number on the screen. Or if you're new to Broadway and you're looking to connect deeper, please scan the QR code on the screen and a pastor will reply and help you get connected to a place where you can best serve and grow. Now, if you, your family, or your small group want to discuss the sermon further, we wanted to let you know we have a free resource for you. If you scan the QR code on the screen, you'll gain access to our weekly discussion material. You'll hear a short clip from today's sermon that leads into a relevant question. We hope that this will help you engage with the teaching in a deeper way. Lastly, don't forget to check out broadwaychurch.com for all of the things going on at the church. Have a great week.
Hey Broadway, thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Avery and I am one of the pastors here at Broadway. Now we have a ton of stuff happening at the church for you and your family, so why don't you check these things out? This Tuesday, we invite you to join us at the Vancouver campus for a hymn sing at 6.30 p.m. in the Hornby Chapel. This is an opportunity to come together regardless of age and sing beloved classic and ageless hymns. The adult Bible class at the Vancouver campus is beginning a new study on the Lord's Prayer. Join us on Sundays at 10.15 a.m. in the lower auditorium. Our Food for Families program is looking for volunteers at their Vancouver location. We have Tuesday afternoon, Thursday morning, or Thursday afternoon shifts available. This is a great opportunity to serve your community and get to meet some of the other amazing volunteers. Email us today to sign up. Next Sunday, we are beginning our You Asked For It series, and we will be tackling the question, my life is fine, why should I follow Jesus? You don't wanna miss it. Our annual Back to School Blast campaign is here once again. We are giving away 1,000 backpacks to vulnerable kids and hosting a fun event in East Vancouver, South Vancouver, and the Tri-Cities. For $30, you can sponsor a backpack for one child, and for $100, you can provide school supplies for a student, a fun event, and guarantee adopt-to-school support for that child's school for the next year. Help us reach our goal of $100,000. Simply indicate Back to School on your offering envelope. To learn more about our Back to School event and ways to get involved, visit the City Reach website. We want to take a moment to acknowledge one of our staff members, Shelly Clifford, who is celebrating her 40th year working at Broadway Church. This is a huge milestone, and Shelly, we just want to say thank you for all that you've done for this church in those 40 years. We are so grateful for you. If you happen to see Shelly around the church, make sure to congratulate her. If you missed anything that I said, you can always visit our website, broadwaychurch.com, for more information on our ministries and events. And while you're there, make sure to connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube.